Welcome to Bishop Barron Presents. I'm Jared Zimmer, the director of the Word on Fire Institute. And in this episode, Bishop Barron sits down with Dr. Jason Blakely, the author of this new book, We Built Reality. Dr. Blakely is a professor of political science at Pepperdine University. And in this episode, Bishop Barron and he talk about hermeneutics, interpretations of the world, economics, and numerous other topics covered in the book. Be sure to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Well, Jason, wonderful to have you here. Um, thoroughly enjoyed your book, We Built Reality, and I've really been looking forward to this conversation. And uh, Bishop Barron, as always, wonderful to be able to chat with you as well. So, Thanks, Jared. Well, I thought to start us off, a big part of this, this book and our conversation today is about the idea of hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought for the sake of our viewers, it'd be good to kind of define what that means. And so maybe to, to get us going, Bishop Barron, if you could help us define what hermeneutics is. It's a big task. We could do a whole course on hermeneutics. <laughs> uh, the word comes from uh, Hermes, the Greek god of, of, he's the messenger god, the god of communication. So hermeneutics is really the art and science of interpretation. Roots of it, at least in the modern sense, go back probably to the early 19th century in biblical interpretation, how to read the Bible. One way I, th I always think to get at it is to say, what does it mean to mean? So you say, well, that's what that text means. Well, what do you mean when you say that? Some people say, well, it's what the author intended. That's what the text means. And many people in the 20th century would quarrel with that. I've always liked people like uh, uh, Gadamer and Recur and those that would say that the meaning of a text occurs at a crossing of worlds. The interpreter comes with a set of questions and assumptions and perspectives. The world of the text opens up. The two of them meet. And that's what the meaning of the text is. So generally, it's the art and science of interpreting text. I would say it's hermeneutics. Yeah, Jason, you've done a lot of work in, in hermeneutics as well. So maybe is there anything you can kind of add to that? Yeah, that in a way, and that was a beautiful, by the way, description of hermeneutics, an excellent one. I think a real big development in the history of the art of interpretation is when it shifted from texts to the interpretation of human behavior, mm -hmm. societies, so there came to be this idea that was held that, at least among some people, that what you should also do is interpret um, the beliefs and meanings, the practices of society. And so that what you need is an art of interpretation to understand other human beings. Mm. And in what way does that help humanity or in what way does that kind of help academia? What are, what are we you know, dealing with there? I think the problem is that oftentimes, instead, a science supplants the art of interpretation. And so, although no one would dream of going up to a Shakespeare text or the Bible and saying, I have a science of how to explain why Hamlet, you know, kills his uncle when he finally kills his uncle, we do something like that with social reality. We say, we have a science for why this person won this election, or we have a science for why this person bought this consumer item, or why we police the way we police, when in fact what we have is much closer to what Bishop just described, in my view anyway, which is an art of trying to interpret and grasp meanings. And so oftentimes we lose sight of that interpretive task of being sensitive to people's beliefs, meanings, and encountering those. Interesting. I know in your book, one of the first points you make is this, this issue of a double H effect. And so I thought maybe you could kind of explain a little bit of what that is and why it might be problematic. Yeah, so the book, one of the central claims of the book is that, in fact, the human sciences are not like the natural sciences. And one way at that is what I call double H effects. And the idea there essentially is that interpretations of the world, so descriptions we have of the world, theories, economic theories, um, psychological theories, can actually enter into our life worlds because we're self-interpreting animals. Mm -hmm. So unlike the natural sciences, if I describe, say, the sun, I have a theory of the sun, it doesn't actually change its positioning. If I change the stars, the constellations don't reverse around, I just get it wrong. Yeah. But in the human sciences and the social sciences, which is where I come out of, the theory can in fact change the world. You end up with a theory like Marxism and you end up with a world that tries to be like Marxism. Mm -hmm. You have a theory like Freudianism and suddenly you have practices, psychoanalytic practices, people practicing confession in a way that's not quite the Christian way, it's, it's like a new secularized confession. And so this double H effect is the way that in human sciences, a theory doesn't just ever describe, it also has the potential to enter and create new realities. I see. So Bishop, do you, do you hear a little bit of kind of maybe a, a drifting into scientism in regard to hermeneutics? Yeah, it's one thing I really appreciate in your book because I, I deal with scientism all the time in my uh, evangelical and apologetic work because young people especially are so formed by that view of the world that the sciences, the natural sciences, explain reality. And so knowledge becomes simply coterminous with the scientific way of knowing the world. 
something you keep emphasizing in the book is this more narrative, poetic uh, quality of human behavior that we can't simply reduce it to something measurable by scientific uh, methods. And that gets in the way of a lot of religious rhetoric. Because if you start talking in a religious uh, manner, people say, well, it's not science. Therefore, it must be nonsense. <laughs> Those are the, the two options. So I like the recovery of that more mythic, poetic, scientific, contingent, open-ended uh, quality when looking at human behavior. It mm -hmm. can't be reduced uh, to the scientific mode. Well, and I think that's actually one of the forms of knowledge that we've lost in the modern mm -hmm. world is that basically narrative, the art of interpretation is, if you like, connected to a set of, set of wisdoms or wisdom traditions. Some of them are conflicting, but we've reduced or there's a tendency to reduce everything to sort of scientific knowledge, law-like explanations. Mm -hmm. And so the notion that a story has something to teach you is sort of relegated to childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, stories are for children. And that, of course, does intersect with the major uh, world with religions, with Catholicism. The notion that there's a story that is actually sort of the key explanatory um, element to understanding the human situation. If you think that you always need a scientific explanation and that stories are for children, then you're going to be very close to hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not going to see anything for you in hermeneutics. It might be fine for children. It might be fine for students in college you know, who are studying these texts. But why do I need hermeneutics to understand my neighbor, my own desires, or what's going on in my society? And that loss is really an impoverishment. I think it does have to do with the falling away of the word wisdom, which a lot of people are confused by on the street today. But they know what they mean by knowledge, right? Yeah. Knowledge is scientific. Mm -hmm. There's a marquee. We're all after that. But wisdom, what's that? No one has wisdom anymore. And stories are for children. So we've kind of blocked ourselves off from certain profound sources of how to live and how to decipher um, how to pursue goals and, and construct a society. Something I do is interesting in those conversations with um, people on the, on the web, you know, and trying to explore the religious reality, and they're, they're stuck in a scientific view. And I'll say, well, look at, at um, you know, Plato's Republic, or look at, at um, Hamlet, or look at T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I said, yes, they're literary artifacts, and yes, they're of historical interest, but do they tell you nothing true? <laughs> like there's mm. nothing true being conveyed to you by Plato's Republic or by, by Hamlet. And I think people are, are compelled to say, well, yeah, I guess they do say true things. <laughs> well, therefore, there must be a non-scientific way of conveying truth. Um, philosophy fits in there. You know, a philosophical Absolutely. mode, which is a rational mode of discourse, but not a scientific mode of discourse, which is why we talked about this before. I think that's an important bridge in the sort of science-religion debate. Mm -hmm. It's not to just uh, propose that you know, binary option. But in the middle of those two is something like philosophy or these meaning-making mm -hmm. uh, narratives and, yeah. and uh, forms of argument, even. It's a philosophical argument. It's not a scientific argument, not based on the scientific method, but yet entirely rational. That has been compromised mm -hmm. a lot, I think, in our educational system and in the popular culture. So right, the, the binary there is science or for kids. Mm -hmm. You tell the kids, oh yeah, the sun goes to bed at night. But then when you grow up, you study Stephen Hawking, you know, but <laughs> there's something between those two uh, uh, options, you know. Yeah, we've, you know, been known as meaning makers, and I love that you bring that up several times uh, in the book. And it seems to me that whenever we sort of get rid of these kind of more poetic routes of epistemology of the human person and you purely focus on the scientific, mm -hmm. you start to use individuals, right? right. Um, and that goes into this kind of vision of economics being uh, one of those double H effects and interpretation of the world as just sort of resources that, that we can use. Um, so I'd love to hear more about kind of why economic vision really shaped a lot of our kind of consumer culture that we have today. Right, exactly. So a lot of the book is it consists of examples of double H effects, of different theories that have sort of entered into our life world, if you like, and have changed it and restructured it. One of the ones that I go into is homo economicus. So the way that in around mid-century, uh, basically neoclassical economics proposed a vision of human beings that was highly idealized. It, it said that human beings were basically preference maximizers, and they ranked their preferences and behaved more or less like on a market. Mm -hmm. Um, and that vision of human beings, which philosophers call homo economicus, which just means it's Latin for you know, human beings as economic creatures, mm 
actually started to change the life world. It started to change the way people interpreted themselves. It started to change, if you like, the stories they lived to connect it to the point we were just making. Mm -hmm. So people thought, I have this science of economics. We could discuss, you know, we could have a long debate to what degree is neoclassical economics a science, to what degree is it not. But what interests me in the book more than that was to bracket that question and ask, but what does it look like when I try to become more like that theory? Yeah. And one of the things that's fascinating is if you look at, say, um, the early aughts, the late 90s, big books were things like Freakonomics. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of the construction of a popular scientific authority. And it interested me the way in which human beings tried to mimic that authority in their relationships, um, in their communities, local life, et cetera. And so uh, something that worried me, and, and this comes from my position, in fact, as a Catholic, I don't think you have to be Catholic. You, can, you have a common meeting ground on hermeneutics, on the insight that human beings are storytelling animals that live out stories. But as a Catholic, one of the things that worried me is, is exactly what you're saying, which is if I view all of my relationships as interactions on a market, what happens to uh, the dignity of the human person? What happens to the notion that I can't calculate some relationships? Some relationships are, if you like, incalculable. They don't fit within a market grid. Because uh, homo economicus tends to think I can swap things out. I'm, I'm tired of this spouse, so if you like, I maximize my preference with a new spouse. And, um, but what happens to these relationships that if I... I lose them, they do great damage to me in some sense that is not calculable because they do something to the intrinsic meanings mm -hmm. that comprise my story, mm -hmm. who I am. And so one of the worries in the book underlying, I don't state it outright, is that there's a loss of a kind of personhood through some of these theories. So interesting. I, I like that part of the book too, and you reference Milton Friedman a lot there. And I remember Milton Friedman on the old Phil Donahue show. So I was maybe a young man in my 20s. And Friedman was a great teacher, a great mm, popular teacher. For sure. And he was the advocate of this, you know, kind of very free market approach to the economy. Um, it was the time of Ronald Reagan. I mean, so that was very much in vogue. The church certainly favors the market. So you look at Centesium was honest and so on. But always the market circumscribed, both legally and, and morally. Uh, homo economicus, okay, that's one dimension of who we are, you know, but the reduction of the whole human project to that. And a strong biblical and traditionally Catholic sense of, of the totality of our humanity, which includes that dimension but goes far beyond it. Um, that's the danger, isn't it, of, of like the, a pure Milton Friedman approach, is that it, it just reduces the human project to one dimension. Um, so I think that's where Catholic social teaching is a very important element in the conversation that you're inaugurating here. And what's the kind of balance or, or way in which to understand sort of the, 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 there is some good in the free market in the sense of helping populations rise out of poverty and things like that, but then there's this hermeneutic that creates kind of an interpretation of the human person then. So what, what is that, that balance of saying that in the pure economic realm, there are some systems that are better than others. Mm -hmm. We can probably have a you know, debate about that mm -hmm. of which ones are better than others. But then there's the difference of even, say, in a socialistic understanding, there's a homo economicus reality in sure. that as well. So how do you kind of balance those two kind of worldviews? Well, one thing to recognize, I think, that hermeneutics shows us is that we're in the Imago Dei. So we are creative animals that create worlds. I mean, if you look at, say, a dog or a cat or a bear, they can encounter another animal within their species, getting out of my my expertise here, but they can encounter another animal from a species, and they more or less share a form of life. That doesn't mean they get along. I mean, we could talk to biologists, what do bears do when they meet in the wild? Human beings, however, dwell in worlds of meaning. They live out such radically different stories that if you take a plane right now and land in, say, Tokyo, uh, you will be complete, you will have lost your bearings entirely. You won't, if you don't have access to those stories, that language, that history, you'll be completely sort of mm -hmm. out of sorts. Mm -hmm. And I partly take that as an indication that human beings are creative meaning makers. In the Catholic tradition, you see a great instance of that in Michelangelo, the fresco of you know, the creation of Adam, yeah. where God's creativity is reflected in Adam's creativity, and in fact is reflected in Michelangelo's virtuosic creativity in even making that painting. Um, so we're world dwellers. We make worlds much like God makes the world. Um, and so one of the things to recognize there is that we, there's always a question of our freedom and what kind of world we would like to have, what kind of an economy we would like to have. Do all human societies have an economy? Yes. 
do all human societies have the same economy? No, not at all. And so there's always the question for us, what kinds of meanings do we want to inscribe? And I think one of the dangers of a free market um, homo economicus, which is this sort of exaggerated, unbounded view, which, by the way, a lot of professional economists will not accept. It's kind of a popularized version sure. I talk about in the book, is that it tends to like naturalize that world. It makes it seem like that world is inescapable. Yeah. And since I know this is a lot of Catholics are listening, I mean, you even think of something like the Acts of the Apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that they shared everything in common, and it was from each according to uh, their ability, each according to their need. Karl Marx then stole that line, and everyone quotes it as a Marxist line, but it's the apostles who were living that way. Now, the point is, do we go back to living like the apostles or not? No. The point is that we have a certain responsibility, and our freedom is in play as human beings, our creative capacities. And the question for us is, how do we, or as Catholics anyways, how do we organize an economy that lives up to our dignity in the Imago Dei. And the church leaves a great deal of leeway for us to think and have conflict even about that as sure. Catholics. Um, do we have an economy that emphasizes very heavily private property, free enterprise? Do we have one that instead emphasizes a social, what's called a social market, you know, where it's, it's, it's highly embedded? Catholics have disagreed on that. Sure. Um, but what I guess I'm really resisting, we all come out in different positions, what I'm really resisting is the naturalization of yes. one life world as a science, that you must mm -hmm. live out this particular dispensation because it's inescapable in some sense. Yeah, I think one of the balancing effects that you provide in the, the book as well is some of the visions of the founding fathers, talking about American economy, that many of them were free market economists, but they were also heavily kind of ensconced in the idea of virtue mm -hmm. um, being the kind of balancing effect between subsidiarity and solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, that concern for the other, and that's where virtue comes from. And unfortunately, a lot of the kind of uh, more modern laissez-faire economists, they have lost a lot of that, and it's purely about economics. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I actually think one of the things that one of the ways to understand homo economicus is a theory that started to shape our world in a way that might be ethically problematic is to go back to earlier versions of economics. Even if you go back to Adam Smith, everyone reads mm -hmm. The Wealth of Nations. No one reads his tract on moral sentiments anymore. Yeah. But if you go back to that first generation, and I talk about it with people like Washington and so on, they believed in the interests, economic interests, and the sentiments. You had to inculcate sentiments of empathy, or Adam Smith calls it fellow feeling, and what I think you get in the second generation of sort of free market theory is a much more idealized, in some sense, logically rigorous, rational choice, game type vision, but it's all interests. And the theory doesn't have any space for the sentiments. In fact, the sentiments are just another interest on that view. They can reinscribe it into a view that while Mother Teresa prefers to maximize her interest by helping the poor in Calcutta, and Steve Jobs prefers to maximize his interest by you know, getting fabulously wealthy and making you know, iPads or something. And it's all the same because you're just maximizing your preferences. And so you get this kind of view that, although it claims to be descriptive, is actually subverting certain moral languages, where I would want to say, no, but Mother Teresa is doing something that comes, if you like, to use the older language, from a sentiment, a virtue, that is not simply reducible to self-interest. And we lose that if we reinscribe everything. And so I think there was, one of the things I talk about in the book, I think there was a break or a discontinuity between earlier liberalism of the founding generation, classical liberalism, I'm using the term not here in the, in the modern culture war sense, but in the sense that covers a, a broader political sure. tradition. Earlier liberalism had a, a space theoretically for the sentiments, and Adam Smith even says, if you don't have the sentiments, society will not stay together very long. And yeah. in a way, I think we're seeing that. We're seeing a society that has been so much about individual interest that left, right, People are very bad at a commons, at thinking about and inculcating as character a commons, something where we share a sentiment, a fellow feeling, and empathy with one another. You know, it's a story that matters, as you say. And if the story behind, let's say, classical uh, liberalism, as Hauerwas said, you know, the, the only story I have is the one I make up for myself, mm -hmm. well, that's deeply problematic for a Catholic, because mm -hmm. we don't say we make up our own story, or it's just a matter of my private choice. But rather, I belong to a story already. And see, I think the church has gotten very bad at telling that story. That's called evangelization, that you belong to this story that includes creation, the fall, the formation of Israel, the coming of the Messiah, and now the age of the church. And your identity is not something that you create. So that's my, my mm. uh, constant battle against what I call the culture of self-creation. Mm. I just generate my own meaning. And then I've got a whole range of choices. So I can choose this, 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 or that. 
But that's not at all the biblical story, which is that you have been chosen. You've been inserted into a story. You were born into a story that you didn't start. You're not telling it. You're trying to find your role in it. Mm -hmm. And now we're in Act 5 of this theodrama. You better know Acts 1 through 4. And that's the problem, I think, with a lot of Catholics, frankly, is that we're in this we're in the last act of Macbeth, but we haven't even paid attention to Acts 1 through 4. Macbeth. So what are we doing? Well, then we start doing whatever the culture tells us to do. Mm-hmm. Or the culture tells us, no, you have complete freedom to determine who you are. But then, then I'm lost, you know. Evangelization is the telling of the story by which we interpret our lives properly. So I think the two things are very uh, tightly linked, actually, what you're putting your finger on. And what Word on Fire is always trying to do is, is tell the story now in a compelling way that people find it not oppressive to their freedom, but, but it awakens their freedom in the proper sense. But it's, it's the story thing, I think, is very powerful. Uh, how do you tell it in a compelling way to this society, which is more and more um, militates against it? Mm-hmm. But we got to find a way to insert people within that narrative so that they, can, they know who they are. They know what to do in Act 5 of the, of the drama. I love this point because in a way something that's very striking about Jesus, for instance, is that he doesn't write anything down, right? Mm -hmm. He lives a story and the word became flesh. And I don't think it's accidental that hermeneutics in its modern form, Bishop gave a great sort of thumbnail sketch of where hermeneutics emerged. It emerges out of biblical Mm -hmm. study. I I don't think only Christians can affirm the truths of hermeneutics. I think there's kind of a shared space there Mm -hmm. for people from various spiritual dispositions. But I don't think historically it's accidental that Christians were very attuned to this notion Mm -hmm. that story is a lived thing. And I, I love this point because I think one of the dangers we face is that a lot of modern people, since they think stories are sort of optionals or they think they're kind of an infantilized genre for kids, they don't, often we don't realize that we live stories whether we want to or not. Yeah. And so we're conscripted into stories or we stumble into stories or we live in coherent stories, like a clash of stories. But unless we become aware of the depth of narrativity and the fact that the word became flesh, that it's inescapable for us, then we're going to live out stories without ever really having become good at the art of interpretation at hermeneutics. So I might live out a very bad story where I think, oh, you know, to be Mother Teresa or to marry this person or to date this person, all of that is just like a market set of actions. I'm just maximizing preferences. I think people who live that way don't realize they're living a story or they're living a bad story and often do damage and are confused. Why am I unhappy? Why, Why did that relationship not go the way I wanted exactly? And I think that um, part of, to go back to the wisdom knowledge distinction, part of the inculcation of wisdom is to start to be aware as modern people that there are, if you like, sources of deep stories that you can go back to mm-hmm. And you can try them out if you like even. I mean, I even tell my friends, I have a lot of friends who are atheists. I used to be an atheist. And, you know, you can try try out the Christian stories, Pascal's point. Like, don't ask yourself first if you believe. Mm-hmm. Try to live the story for a year and see if living that story lives better than your other story. Or meet with people who are living that story. Do you find that lived story attractive? And unfortunately, we just don't have a language for this because of a sort of technical mentality or attitude that says... Stories aren't really happening in the flesh. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very attentive to movies. I've been watching movies for a long time for, you know, pleasure, but also for the sake of evangelization. Because talk about where the stories are told in a given culture. How many times in a movie do you find this narrative? I got to shake off the received tradition. I got to shake off the authority of whoever it is, parents or church or society. And I got to find my own voice. And I got to be empowered to do what I want to do. I mean, again and again and again, that story is told. That's the great archetype of modernity, you know. Um, But what about now the life you're leading? Is it a good life? So by God, you chose it. By God, you threw off authority. Good for you. And now you, but is that a good life or or not? (laughs) You know, but that's the master narrative very often. Like when I saw the movie Shape of Water, I remember turning to Father Steve. I saw it with him and I said, that's going to win the best uh, picture, which indeed it did. I said, it's the perfect modern story, you know, the shape of water. Water has no shape unless I give it a particular shape. It's what I want to do. And the religious figures in that movie are oppressive and stupid and, you know, fundamentalistic. And there it is. There's the modern archetype, you know. So we've got to get a lot better at telling the great story. 
Yeah, you know, and one of the great things about a story and a lived story is that good story provides sort of this order to life. And it's a, an ordered liberty. It's not that it, mm -hmm. you know, chains you down or anything, but it creates these kind of rules. There's a referee involved of, in some sense. But the biggest question with all of these stories is, is it true? Yeah. Right, And so your, your question about is it a good life, I think that's where a lot of our culture gets this wrong, especially when it comes to ideas of economics or in a minute we'll talk about some of these kind of uh, ideas of psychology and homo uh, machina. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of happiness itself, mm -hmm. of what makes a human person happy, we, we get that dead wrong a lot. Mm -hmm. well, what you just said I think is really right about trying on a story. So mm -hmm. the post-liberals use that language a lot. And they're borrowing in a way from like William James that you verify, like you make something true. And I don't mean that in the pure kind of pragmatist sense, but there's something right about, okay, here's this narrative. How's it working as I live that narrative? You know, does it open up life in a richer way? Does it correspond to my own deepest aspirations? Um, it's like Jared Manley Hopkins, you know, the famous line when, I, I don't believe in God, what should I do? And he said, give alms. Mm -hmm. Enter into the narrative. Mm -hmm. Try it on. Mm -hmm. Try it on. Be, try being a saint. And I think you'll find the truth of it verified as you live. And I'm, I'm with Newman. It's, it's rarely by means of a clinching argument that we say, oh, yeah, that's true. It's by a conjuries of influences and hunches and intuitions and experiences. And as I work my way through the narrative and live it out dramatically, I say, yes, that's true. You know, yeah. that opens up the deepest meaning of things. So. I think that's a very interesting point of how we learn something to be true. Yeah, and one of the things I love, for instance, about Augustine's Confessions is it opens mm -hmm. up famously as just a series of just mind-blowing questions. So mm -hmm. it's not just a problem for the other, for my neighbor. It's a problem always for myself. Are my desires structured in a way that makes sense in terms of the story I'm living? Right. So, mm -hmm. oh, God, my heart is restless. Why? I mean, Augustine is, he realizes the confusion is on the inside, too, and yeah. that as he searches for the mystery of love that's supposed to make sense out of his life, that it remains a question for him too on the inside. And I think that, to add to Bishop's point, uh, that we're also not very good at creating or being open to spaces of encounter with other kinds of stories. So for instance, Father Greg Boyle in Los Angeles, where I live, he has this gang intervention program, most effective gang intervention program in the country. What does he do? He offers the homies, ex-gang members, a job, if they're in goodwill, no matter what. He even sort of says um, prankishly that, uh, you know, he only hires hoodlums. But that is not the logic of homo economicus, where supply and, and demand on a labor market, and in fact, that's what Father Greg found out. He went to Boyle Heights. Former gang members were unhirable on the sort of mechanics and rationality mm -hmm. of the free market. And so he took this other logic, which is the logic of the church, what he calls kinship. I will give you a job no matter what. And what's interesting about that is if you encounter that story, I have a lot of friends in Los Angeles who aren't Catholic, they're deeply moved mm -hmm. when they go to Homeboy because the homies feel loved by Father Greg and they communicate sort of an encounter with a different story that was being lived, mm -hmm. if you like. They don't say it that way, but they say, I finally met a father, I never had a father. Maybe my father beat me, maybe my father was on drugs, maybe my father left. Mm -hmm. But Father Greg was a father. He, mm -hmm. he offered me a kind of no matter whatness, as Father Greg calls it. So I also think that in our own confusion, our own sadness, our own tendency to stray, which Augustine always saw, there, there is always the question of, do I, do I still understand the Christian story itself as something that makes sense for me today, as something that is a story I'm living? Because I think we have our own incoherences constantly that Augustine was sort of attuned to. And we have our tendency to be conscripted into other stories without even knowing it, right? You could call that, if you like, in the church's language, sin. So it's not always sin. Sometimes, you know, there's something there to affirm. But you can get led astray without really even knowing it, in a sense, that you're not following the story. You know, it struck me as you told the story there of Greg Boyle. Um, the question of positioning, you know, what positions what? Who positions whom? So the great Christian narrative can include a lot of sub-narratives. So for example, he receives these kids according to a Christian vision of things, but by God, he gets them a job. Mm -hmm. He wants them to work. He, he wants them eventually within the market economy and making money and, and mm -hmm. maturing and so on within it. But he's positioning the free market by the greater story of Christianity, Absolutely. not vice versa. Yeah. Not drawing Christianity as like a little sort of helper story within the great story <laughs> of homo economicus, but the other way. And that's that's good. I mean, then we can have room for these other 
narratives and ways of understanding humanity, but from the master perspective of the great story, of the incarnation, finally, you know, the word becoming flesh. And he's a Jesuit priest, and so it's coming up out of Jesus, finally, that vision of things. Yeah, and one other um, kind of hermeneutic that you provide in the, the book is the idea of homo machina, and I'll mm-hmm. give you an opportunity to kind of define that, but I found that chapter very, very interesting, especially in regard to the idea of self-help culture mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and sort of the atomization that can occur because of that, but maybe explain a little bit about what, what that interpretation is, is doing. Sure, not unlike homo economicus, I go into like a sort of short history of the emergence of a rival anthropology to hermeneutics, which says that we're self-interpreting, storytelling, story-living animals. And in the case of homo machina, what's going on is it's the tendency, most briefly, to sort of read yourself as a mechanic, a machine, um, in impersonal terms, as a set of causal relations that don't have any personal attributes to them, like beliefs, like Mm -hmm. meanings. Um, What's interesting is if you go back to the early versions of homo machina, which I do very briefly in the book, you'll see that there's a tendency to reverse engineer the latest technology into an anthropology. So if you go back to someone like Thomas Hobbes, He has these wonderfully evocative phrases because he was just a brilliant rhetorician where he says, what is the heart but springs? You know, what is what is the mind but a bunch of strings? So what he's doing is he's envisioning early mechanics, clocks and early like sort of factory mechanics. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that's what we are. Mm -hmm. Now, the version I spend the most time with in the book is actually to reverse engineer the computer. So today the state of the art is the computer. And so then we use our imaginations, I think people like Steven Pinker, to say, ah, what if we're just computing Mm -hmm. animals? And you get an entire psychological paradigm based on computational theory of mind. I discuss it in the book. Um, So what happens, a big question for me, and I go into a lot of examples in those chapters, is what happens when I start to self-interpret as a mechanics? Um, Mm -hmm. In my dating life, you know, do I just try Mm -hmm. to see myself as sort of like a machine of chemicals, Mm -hmm. um, depression, uh, hyperactivity, what happens to my sort of lived senses of, of my desires, of the things I encounter when I think I'm mostly, say, a computing machine or I'm a chemical machine? There are a lot of homo machinas, if you like. They're rival homo machinas. Mm-hmm. Um, but what does is, what is the cultural life look like mm-hmm. when that happens? You know, stay with Hobbes for a second because I, I found that fascinating. I first read Hobbes under the direction of the great Robert Sokolowski at Catholic mm-hmm. U years ago. And he pointed out to us the beginning of the Leviathan that no one ever reads, but it's the section <laughs> all on, on natural science and, yeah. and things are, you know, atoms in motion. And so he lays that out. And then he says, well, look, the same thing applies to human beings. We're just like these atoms in motion and we want to avoid violent death and we seek to stay alive. And so we can, I can get you to behave any way I want by giving you the right sort of thread and the right sort of invitation. But it was the transition, Sokolowski always said, from properly political philosophy to political science. Mm-hmm. We call it today, it's a political science. Mm-hmm. But something had radically shifted in our mentality when you start looking at politics that way. And now, softened by Locke, to be sure, and by Jefferson, but Sokolowski argued, still a basically Hobbesian vision mm-hmm. undergirds much of, of our modern political sensibility. Yeah. So we still think of it along more scientific lines mm-hmm. than meaning-making lines or religious lines or philosophical lines even. I think that's very interesting, the Hobbesianism. And he is a brilliant rhetorician. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Sokolowski always told us, if you love English, read Hobbes, wonderful writer. But he seduced us in a way, didn't he, into a manner of thinking about politics that's, that's inimical you know, to, I say, a, a richly imagined biblical way of thinking about it. Uh, that's a great point. And I mean, one of the things I try to do in the book is turn the tables on people who say they have a science Mm-hmm. And then I read it as a poetics. Mm-hmm. I just start yeah. from the hermeneutic perspective. Yeah. And so to me, it's not accidental that when you read someone like Hobbes, it turns out that he was a brilliant poetic mind. Mm-hmm. He, didn't, he thought he was just sort of adding instrumentally an element to a true scientific theory. Mm-hmm. We're all a mechanics. The Leviathan of the state is a mechanics, what mm-hmm. Bishop was just discussing. But in fact, what I think what he was doing was sort of charming us with a poetics and a meaning that we then went on to enact. And someone I'm quite hard on in the chapter is Cass Sunstein, the, the Obama um, appointee in Nudge, who mm-hmm. similarly, I think, is actually quite brilliant with metaphor. He doesn't think it, but the whole metaphor of a nudge, this, this wildly popular book that um, Sunstein wrote, is that the state, instead of using like a hard technocratic hand, can sort of use different incentives according to sort of um, behavioral economics and different social scientific theories to sort of engineer outcomes. He calls it choice architecture. Mm -hmm. Um, But what interested me in the book was to sort of turn the tables and say, 
let's, let's assume with hermeneutics that this is not a science and that the science is a mission impossible because humans are self-interpreting and they have agency. What's going on here? And part what's going on is that if you like people like Thaler and Sunstein, Hobbes, they're poeticizers of a way of living that is a more managerialized form of democracy, more top down. I think I call it an apologia for rule by Ivy League elites, that yeah. it's not accidental that it was sort of the self-satisfied politics, not to be too controversial, but like of the Obama administration that was sort of um, drawn to Sunstein's theories at that moment, right? Because yeah. In a way, he was poeticizing or uh, mythologizing sort of a way of ruling by technocrats, whereas I prefer sort of a participatory form of democracy from the bottom up, right? Whereas someone like Sunstein prefers like a kind of top-down mechanics. He's got a science of democracy. So you end up with like managerialized democracies when you think of society and humans as machines or other forms of regime that are highly technocratic as well. Yeah. Well, you're like, a, you're like a scientist in a lab and there's the mice down in the maze and you're gonna get, get exactly. you to go this way. So that's the master metaphor, right? Yeah. You're sort of supervising this whole thing and you make people behave. But the roots of that are Hobbes, it seems mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. That's the shift that happened mm -hmm. in our political thinking. And one of the um, interesting kind of shifts that I noticed in the book as well is um, the, the shift from a psychological understanding of depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. things like that, into a pharmacological, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, pharmacology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, I think of Freud, and he was a meaning maker. He mm -hmm. understood metaphor. He understood what the mind can do and why we need these stories, um, although he had his own issues with religion and yeah. things like that. Uh, but eventually it got to the point of this kind of Hobbesian of, I'm a machine, and if mm -hmm. I put this thing in my body, it'll make me operate the way I, I want to operate. Um, and so I thought that that was such a, a real example of why that can be dangerous. Yeah, Freud, Freud is a great example of that, and Freud is just a brilliant psychologist who also goes spectacularly wrong in some places, in my view. I think it was Vladimir Nabokov who said that Freudianism is the application of ancient Greek myth to your genitals. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's that stuff of Freud I'm not interested in, but Freud, you're right. He was sensitive to the meaning elements. He was yeah. sensitive to the complexity of desire, the unconscious, I don't know what I'm desired. Do I desire what I desire? Mm -hmm. Why do I will what I don't want to will? These Augustinian um, the, uh, sort of hangups. And unfortunately, in this sense, uh, the, the, the salutary elements of Freudianism have been replaced, I think, by a lot of clunky sort of reductive paradigms that are more of a homo machina view. I want to be clear you know, with viewers that I'm not saying you should never take yeah, prescription sure. pills for depression or so on. I think they're overprescribed, which I don't think is a particularly controversial position, even from the perspective of the people who prescribe them. Mm -hmm. But what worries me more in the book is what happens when, say, my sadness doesn't cue me into anything anymore, yeah. right? So if we're meaning-making animals who live out stories, it may be that my sadness is appropriate. It may be that it, to right. go down to the reductive right. route isn't always appropriate. I might be sad because there's great injustice in the uh -huh. world. I might be sad because my heart is made for something bigger than mm -hmm. this. But for instance, if someone says to me, why are you sad, Jason? And I say chemicals, someone will say, okay, fine, like go <laughs> right. take. But if I, someone says, why are you sad? And I say, my, my best friend just died. That's very different. And if I were to, if you my best be friend, had, yeah, if my yeah. best friend just died and I say chemicals, people are really going right. to think there's something wrong yeah. with me. So what worries me is, a psych depth psychology has been lost, yeah, and yeah. there are minority positions in psychology, but we've gone so far in the direction of homo machina that we're right. not attentive anymore to it, these It's elements. a super important point, and that's happened in, certainly in my lifetime. I remember, you know, as a young man, the Freudian, let's say a, even a Jungian approach. Jung had a very rich sense of, you know, archetypal images and myth and religion and all this stuff. And the talking cure, you know, and I'll say what you want about it with its limitations, and it's got limitations, but still you were trying to talk your way to a, a story. You were yeah. trying to find your, mm -hmm. your path, you know? And what you just said, I think, is dead right about someone going through anxiety or going through sadness. If we simply say, oh, it's a chemical thing, take a pill to get rid of it, and acknowledging fully, yes, there are times when I think people really sure. can and should do just that, because it's such an extreme case. But the danger is that we lose the narrative around which those things begin to make some sense, or I can situate them. Even something as simple as when I'm a, as a little kid and we'd be going through some you know, tough thing, my mother would say, offer it up. Now you say, well, that's nice kind of Irish piety. But what it was doing in her own way was that she was situating whatever that anxiety was within this cosmic context of meaning and that you could actually offer your sadness or your anxiety for the benefit of someone in, in God's world and you can yeah. involve the saints. Well, there's an example of how do you bring your emotional life into relation to a much bigger story. 
And right, the homo machina thing is such a reductive view, but man, is it, is it widespread. And it does, there's your double H thing, it really affects the way we actually live, you know? Which is why we have this paradox of um, more people diagnosed with depression than ever before, yeah. supposedly a scientific cure for it, but it just keeps growing. And I think yeah. one of the reasons for that is our therapeutic is too narrow. Yeah. It's not yeah. that it shouldn't include some of the insights yeah. of biology, et cetera, but we have a very reduced, and the other thing that sneaks in, of course, is an ethical vision, which yeah. I don't need to tell Catholics, is like, there's a tendency to talk about stories to go in and you're told, well, for instance, the object of therapy is just to make you not have any hangups and just have self-esteem. Now, I also believe that people should love themselves, be able to affirm themselves, <laughs> but oftentimes the story there is, to go back to what we were discussing earlier, kind of atomistic yeah. self that throws off tradition and tradition is the source of your hangups, et cetera. Right, yeah. So sometimes what you'll get, in fact, is an ethical vision presented as a scientific one. Oh, yeah. we're just giving you, you know, softball or mass, it doesn't matter. Swap in whichever one makes you feel better in the weekend, yeah, right? Yeah. Or, um, but the goal is just autonomy yeah. as yeah. opposed to um, reparation, spiritual awareness, openness to maybe like search. Um, oftentimes the, the goal is in fact an ethical vision posing as just a neutral. And I don't think in that sense it's accidental that it's flourished. Um, it's not the same thing as homo economicus, but I don't think it's an accident that homo machina and certain therapeutic visions have flourished together mm -hmm. because in a way they repair you to then again be a good yeah. sort of consuming actor yes. within a sort of neutral market society where you, know, you have your preferences, the mm -hmm. other person has their preferences and so on. Yeah, I would certainly have a, a lot of issues with some of the aspects of Freud, but I remember in his Civilization and Its Discontents, he has a problem with diversions. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a call to go into the work, do the excavation mm -hmm. necessary into your psychology, into the mental processes that are going on that are kind of either destroying or harming your story. Um, and oftentimes what we do now is, what's the easy fix? Mm -hmm. what, what's the thing that's going to fix it within the next couple of hours so that I don't have to feel? <laughs> you know? And that's like Pascal, isn't it? Like if, yes. if I can't sit alone by myself in a, in a room and deal with the deep questions of life. If I say, let me divert myself with some form of entertainment or even divert myself with a, a pill that makes me feel better, yeah. uh, I'm not going to engage the great questions that's within right. a narrative context. So, yeah. And I should say just briefly for anyone uh, you know, who's listening and is suffering with things like depression and then they're hearing this theories they rely on sort of knock down, that there are in fact psychologists, I'm, I'm not just like a voice in the wilderness here, but they're a minority view, people like Philip Cushman, I quote in the book, who believe that part of reparative therapy is storytelling. And yes. so that the stories we tell about ourselves and coming to grips, that was Freud's great insight is, you know, in some sense, I don't understand what just happened to me mm -hmm. and I've got to go back and do work on it. And so I, I do want anyone listening to know there are forms of therapy out there Absolutely. that are sensitive no, to and storytelling. It's a good point too, because I, most of the, of the psychotherapists that I know would say some combination mm -hmm. of the two. And they wouldn't sure. just say, okay, here's take a pill, you'll be fine. Sure. I mean, they'll, they'll in some cases recommend that, but usually coupled with some form of the talking cure or something. So, right, it's a, it's a I think part of where the problem comes in as well, and you do a good job of showing how consumerism finds its way into this. Whenever you, you know, the, the, ch the change for uh, pharmacists to start you know, uh, con <laughs> providing commercials specific to their mm -hmm. product right to the consumer, it gives the consumer the idea that now there's this thing that I can go out to rather than maybe go to a, an expert and trying to do the work with an expert. It's just, let me find that thing so that I can move on with my life. And it might make you sadder in some cases. I mean, yeah. let's leave this to people and their psychologists, but in a sense, the, the prob one of the things that might be causing a sadness is in your heart is, is this all there is, is like a life of lifestyle choices, careerism, and it feels sort of empty. Even when you're winning, it feels empty, but it certainly feels empty when you're losing, in quotes. Yeah. And if the answer is, more consumption, a pill is going to make me happy. It could be that you're actually getting some of, if right. you like, the disease again, yeah. Yeah. and it could send you even further into the sense of malaise. Yeah. And you end the, the book with an excellent question of where are the new humanities? I thought mm -hmm. that was such a fantastic way to kind of continue the conversation uh, because one thing that we talk about a lot at Word on Fire is the idea of a, a new apologetics, new, new approaches while still holding to the tradition but not being beholden to it, right? Of being able to understand it but move forward into the current cultural context. So what's, you know, what's the kind of crux of that question and what might a new humanities look like? My hope is that partly hermeneutics become a more widespread educational movement. 
that there, that people begin to gain an awareness that there is something called the art of interpretation, as, as Bishop was discussing at the beginning, and as I also mentioned, and that we can be better or worse at it. And we're not just um, pleasing ourselves when we read Shakespeare. Like, like Bishop said, mm -hmm. like maybe we're in the fifth act of Macbeth. How many people who are listening know what it means to be in the fifth act of Macbeth? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually pretty scary stuff, but, like, but it'd be good to know, not, not even just from the perspective of to situate yourself within a tradition within, as an English speaker, which is certainly enriching to have read Shakespeare, but because Shakespeare was an absolute genius of the art of interpretation, of gauging persons, characters, situations, mm -hmm. And you can get better or worse at that. Mm -hmm. And so part of my hope is, and in fact, we're going in the other direction right now. That might be the fifth act of Macbeth. But right now what's happening is the humanities are getting slaughtered because they're unnecessary, sort of on homo economicus grounds. They don't give good uh, return on investment. And so classics programs mm -hmm. are getting slashed, which I think is very sad. And what we're losing is um, a cultural literacy. And I really do think it has to do with our polarization right now. Is mm -hmm. I'm, we're not good at understanding the meanings other people live on their own terms. So we tend to give diminished stories of what they're living from the outside and then never really hear their story. And hearing their story doesn't mean then I accept or become, or we don't have conflict. But I, for instance, like the, the, the liberal conservative split right now in the country, I think a lot of it has to do with polarization, silos, but also just not really understanding the story the other one's living and why they see yeah. it as good or as attractive. And so the crisis of the humanity, or in other place, fake news, we're very bad at reading news, mm -hmm. li basic literacy news. Yeah. I think all of these come out of the fact that to have a successful democracy, you actually need to have citizens who are good at the art of interpretation. And one of the things I go into the book is the art of interpretation is not elitist in the way that, say, um, the sciences, you know, you have people really have an ability with the sciences and it's a specialized language, you have to be good with math. Stories are more egalitarian form, which is what partly makes mm -hmm. people suspicious to them. I mean, my son right now, he's four years old, he gets stories, like, like Bishop was saying, the sun is going to bed, Sebastian, my son would get that. Yeah. But if you say to him, you know, some mechanical explanation, yeah. he won't understand it. Yeah. Um, so stories we can get better at, but we're always living them, we're always dealing and reckoning with them. And my hope is that a new kind of humanities movement is also tied to a sort of revival of, of democracy, of participation mm. in democratic social life, a feeling like this, like society reflects my story in some mm -hmm. sense, or I have a say in my story, and it's not just being told to me by Milton Friedman or Cass Sunstein. And so, can I ask yeah. you, are you a fan of The Simpsons at all? Yes. There's a great Simpsons episode, I forget why, but Lisa and Homer are talking about the meaning of, of Moby Dick. And Lisa says, Well, Moby Dick, Dad, is the story of, you know, human. Uh, freedom fighting against nature and destiny. And uh, Homer goes, oh, no, Lisa. The meaning of Moby Dick is be yourself. <laughs> and I, I've always loved that because you see your point of we've, we've kind of forgotten how to, it's, an, it's a hermeneutical question. Mm -hmm. How do you read a great text like Moby Dick? You know, the one thing it couldn't possibly mean is be yourself. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, but but that's, it's, a, it's a subtle art, and uh -huh. it's learned in the humanities. It's mm -hmm. learned by engaging texts like Shakespeare and like Herman Melville and everybody else, mm -hmm. you learn how to read them in a sophisticated way, mm -hmm. and at least a relatively adequate way. I mean, the, the debate about what a text means, that's ongoing and all yes. that. But, but that you know how to approach them anyway as a source of truth and a source of meaning. Uh, and that, that's why the loss of the humanities, which we have indeed talked about a lot, mm -hmm. is a major loss yeah. in our society. And it does produce homo economicus, and it does produce the scientific reductionism and with all its attendant problems. So I think the church can and should play a role in that. And our great universities, we shouldn't surrender that. The great Catholic universities should not surrender our liberal arts focus. We shouldn't just cave into the STEM tide. You know, that's that's, right. And I, I see the effects of that all the time. And that's your, there's a double H uh, example, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know, that we, we produce mm -hmm. people who are indeed completely beholden to a scientific view of the world. Um, so that's of great evangelical and, and psychological importance that we recover the humanities, I think. Absolutely. I do want to change gears just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know, Jason, you are a convert uh, to Catholicism. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about maybe your story along the way of what brought you from an atheistic uh, background into now being a Catholic. Well, in a way, I've kind of set myself up for it because my story failed me. I was a very uh, mm. sort of intense kind of an atheist. And I should be fair, I've, I've grown in kind of maturity to recognize I, I was raised in a household where my dad was agnostic, very hostile to religion, extremely articulate, uh, 
um, Anglo Protestant American uh, by background only. And then my mom is um, a Latin American immigrant, highly articulate, but like, so there was Catholic Catholicism there. I was baptized. So sacramentally, I've learned to say, yes, I was a Catholic, but in my self understanding, I've never, I was never Catholic until my mid twenties. I was more my dad's son in that sense. And I was a very intense kind of an atheist. You know, I, I read Heidegger, I read Nietzsche, still pretty up on Heidegger, you know, so, some of Nietzsche is fine, but a lot of it is kind of, and I lived it, you know, I mm. tried to like actually live that ethic. Yeah like that sort of heroic ethic of I make my own meanings, I decide, and it failed me. I, I mm. sort of had a massive sort of malaise in my mid-20s where I didn't know how to make sense of, I felt like I was failing at various things. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to get too far into the weeds, but, um, and, and I couldn't make a coherence out of my life. Yeah. Uh, but I knew enough to know, oh, well, there's this, this story that I've heard that love is a kind of mysterious key, and if you, if you enter into this self-giving love, not a sentimental love, not a, not a romantic love, it, it encompasses those things, but it's yeah. bigger, a self-giving love, that more of reality will make sense. And, and one of the big shocks to me, going from self-understanding as an atheist to a Catholic, is that, and I always tell my atheist friends that this, that I actually feel more in contact with reality, mm -hmm. less deluded, uh, because this self-giving love allows you to self-accuse, mm -hmm. allows you to see your limits, mm -hmm. um, and it puts you in contact with, I think, the, the summit and source of all reality, which is a love that surpasses all understanding. But I, my story failed me. I always think real conversions and not just modern sort of ideological Cartesian sure. conversions mm -hmm. are a thing of the heart, yeah. you know, and there, there's a thing of the heart there. There's a thing with the woman who's now my wife and, and so on, and like my feelings of, of encountering a love I didn't really deserve in mm -hmm. any sense. Um, so there's a bigger story. But there were intellectual blockages too, and Charles Taylor's A Secular Age really threw me for a loop. Mm. I was really helped actually by then Father Barron mm. and Word on Fire. At the time, um, you know, the, the internet was sort of dominated by the new atheists who I never liked, even mm -hmm. though I was an, because I was an enthusiastic <laughs> atheist. Yeah. I didn't think Dawkins and these people were all interesting. One of the things that was so um, compelling about um, then Father Barron, Bishop, was that he was on there and he was able to say, he could quote Christopher Hitchens. He could tell the atheist story in a sense better than they could. And he could tell the theistic story better. He could talk about the Coen brothers, Bob Dylan, in a way that, um, you know, it showed something new about it. Even though he was talking about it from a Catholic perspective, you saw something you hadn't noticed before. So I was actually helped. I, I do owe a debt of gratitude um, to, to uh, Bishop Barron to Word on Fire as sort of um, supplementing my catechesis mm, in my mid-20s. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Well, that's a, a wonderful story. And I thought in particular the, the use of, of Charles Taylor as part of your conversion. Um, maybe you could build on a little bit about that, of, you know, maybe particularly the secular age, why that book and what, what ideas in that mm. book were kind of enlightening to you. Yeah, well, Charles Taylor is probably the most famous living philosopher. A lot of people think he's the greatest living philosopher. I share that opinion. And one, one of the many, many contributions he's made is what does it mean to live in secularity? We could talk about that at great length, but also what does it mean to re-enchant secularity? Because a lot of people experience the secular world, I certainly did as an atheist, as a world sort of stripped of meanings, as a world where there's a loss, a huge loss of um, a, a prior universe or cosmos that was enchanted and that had spirits, and suddenly we're in this kind of disenchanted mm -hmm. iron cage, as Max Weber says. And one of the brilliant things about Taylor is that he finds a new, new pathways into re-enchantment, and one of the big ones for him is, in fact, poetics, that poetics can bring us back into contact with, if you like, a cosmos, and that often how modern people experience the sacred, they might not even use that word, is through art. Art might be the most important thing, the most moving thing to them might be a song they like, or a book they read, or a line, or a painting. And so re-enchantment can happen, a sort of re-entry into a story that puts together pieces again can start to happen through art for Taylor. Yeah, the two types of, of enchantment, because uh, too many moderns for a long time, and very much up till today, will say, well, yeah, once we get rid of that world of, you know, sprites and goblins and, you know, think of two of the very smartest people in the pre-modern period, Origen of Alexandria and Thomas Aquinas, both thought that angels move planets. I mean, so we don't want that kind of enchantment, you know, that, that seems just naive and, and pre-scientific in all the bad ways. But at the same time, Thomas Aquinas had a deeply, if you want, enchanted view of the world because 
God is not a being among many, but ipsum esse, the sheer act of being itself in and through which all things exist. And so a deep contact with reality gives you a deep sense of, of God's presence. Thomas says God is in all things by essence, presence, and power, and most intimately so. Well, that's a mysticism of nature, a mysticism of, you know, of, of the cosmos. That's the cool enchantment that I think we can and should recover. Because in getting rid of the sprites and the goblins, we often were left, as you say, with just this flattened out, you know, self-contained world. And there are avenues, I think, by looking at some of the great figures in our tradition to re-enchant in a good way. I know the two of you have a mutual love of Bob Dylan uh, oh, as yeah. well. So <laughs> we, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I thought maybe to kind of start off, you know, Jason, what kind of introduced you to, to Bob Dylan and then uh, just kind of see where it goes from there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Bob Dylan is a genius. And, uh, you know, you say that and people are like, no, he's a pop star. And it's like, no, he is a literary genius working within a pop form. And I still remember being in high school, public high school in Colorado, and my literature teacher, uh, Charles Dunn, putting on It's All Right, Ma, and it just blew my mind. I did not know you could do that with a song. You know, he not busy being born is busy dying, and it's just a reeling, reeling, uh, sort of surrealistic song. And it just kept growing from there. And um, yeah, he's a po poet in the high sense, and in, in some sense, I think he's brought poetry back to like mm -hmm. Homeric, or what the beats were trying to do. They were trying right. to reunite mm -hmm. yeah. music and poetry, yeah. but they never quite did it. It was like snapping fingers, jazz, you could see where they were going. <laughs> but then Dylan did it. He like actually reunified poetics and music. And I, I get people, my sort of literary friends are like on the page, you know, but it's like Shakespeare on the page isn't sometimes, you know, you got to see right. it as a play. Be performed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite right. I mean, my experience with Bob Dylan started when I was 14. I often think, the two great influences, uh, Thomas Aquinas I discovered when I was 14, and Bob Dylan. Because hmm. I listened to uh, the concert for Bangladesh. Uh, my brother and I were both into the Beatles, and so we're listening to you know, George Harrison and his friends at the concert for Bangladesh. And Harrison says, I want to bring out a friend of us all, Mr. Bob Dylan, and I'd never heard this name. And out comes this figure, you know, and uh, begins to sing, it was Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, which is also kind of this Whitman-esque and deeply biblical, and, and you know, the funny voice, and I'm, I'm listening, I thought, I, I've never heard a popular song like this. And I was just at that point in my life probably discovering what poetry is and how poetry works. And it just, I mean, it just blew me away. And I've never stopped loving Bob Dylan from that moment. I just started following him, listening to him. And then all the changes he's been through. But the common denominator is, is the great poetic imagination. But also, I would say the Bible. If you want to choose one thing that's been present with Bob Dylan all through his career, very much to the present day, is a biblical uh, imagination. Um, but I mean, I could go on and on. There's thousands of things I love about Bob Dylan. But I think what you said about the poetry and the performance of it is very important. Mm -hmm. Because, right, when you show someone a, a, a Dylan lyric on the page, mm -hmm. it, but, but then he sings it, or someone else even sings it. And in the performance, it takes on this extraordinary you know, power. Even though a song like, you know, Tambourine Man or Tangled Up in Blue or Every Grain of Sand, there's a number that you could say, look, stands on its own mm -hmm. as poetry on the page. But I think you're right. It's Shakespearean in that sense. It has mm -hmm. to be performed publicly. And you reach moments of clarity in his writing where it's, it's very, you know, it, it does stand on the page like Bishop is saying. So, you know, I'm thinking of a song like Blind Willie McTell where he says, um, well, God is in his heaven and we all want what's his, but power and greed and corruptible seeds seem to be all that there is. And it opens something. I mean, to make the point back to hermeneutics, poetics is not just an added on. It's not like I put frosting on a cake or I had a nice glass of wine. We dwell poetically. That's Heidegger's point that I sort of return to at the end of the book. So poets open up and give us an articulacy that actually opens new modes and ways of being, where if you take the poetry away from us, if you like, if you take the poets away from us, you actually close certain doors and possibilities for selfhood, for life. And so in that sense, Dylan is, has become more important to me in some ways than a lot of philosophy, even though that's uh, a lot of what I study and I love philosophy, but um, you know, philosophy doesn't get me through when I'm sick or when I'm depressed or I don't know what to say to someone. But poetry can really open a new avenue of self-understanding and of life. Did you, I think you wrote something about this. I might have read it in advance of this. So Dylan, who begins, you know, is a great protest singer mm -hmm. and blowing in the wind and all those songs. And, and he's at the, with Martin Luther King on the mm -hmm. steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And he's very much part of that. But then very early on, like about 1964, 
he really breaks with what he took to be a somewhat simple-minded mm -hmm. approach. And he opened up, I'd say, both psychologically, philosophically, and theologically to much broader horizons. And that song we were talking about before we, we came on today, um, My Back Pages, which is, I think, a very prophetic song for today because it's the Dylan of now 64, 65 looking back and saying, well, yeah, I was saying and doing these things that were, they were good at one level, but it was naive and it was, it was um, um, oppressive to others and, and it carried within it a certain danger, you know. I was so much older than I'm younger than that now, and the he not busy born, busy dying is the opening up to something new. And what it was for him, I think, is, is a transcendent take, mm -hmm. that beyond the politics of the moment and, and the fight for justice and all those good things, but if it doesn't have a transcendent point of reference, it's, it's gonna become um, self-destructive. And I think that's what he saw. And I think in our situation today, when people again are really animated properly about social justice, but without a transcendent referent, without a, that poetic uh, context, it's, it, it'll turn dangerous and violent and problematic, you know? So I, I think there, maybe especially there, he's a, a great prophetic voice today. Yeah, I agree. And the, even the line, I was so much older then, but I'm younger than that now. What keeps us younger? I mean, there is sort of gospel resonances there, but just to look at Dylan's lines in their own terms at that moment, the poets keep us young because they put us back in contact with reality. And mm -hmm. one of the things he says in my back pages is I was using ideas as my maps. In other words, I wasn't seeing people anymore. I wasn't seeing reality. I was lost in ideas, if you like, in mm -hmm. abstraction. And poetry can awaken in us um, a desire to see reality again, yeah. to be in contact with the human person, to be in contact with the mystery, with the transcendent. And so I, I really think that part of being younger again and, and, not, and growing young, even as you grow old, involves poetics and involves an openness to the, the poetic as reality. I wonder if you, if you agree with this. I, I've been thinking about it. Dylan's conversion to explicit Christianity is right about mm -hmm. midpoint of his life, because mm -hmm. now he's just reached his 80th birthday. Who knows how long he'll live, <laughs> but he's 80 now. But he was just about 40, 38, 39, when he becomes a Christian, right in the midpoint. And he becomes a, a type of Christian, though, at that time, the, the mm -hmm. very evangelical, mm -hmm. His uh, speeches from the stage during that period often turned into kind of rants, you know. Mm -hmm. But rather quickly, to me, it always reminds me of the early uh, civil rights stuff, that he, he saw beyond a simplistic version. Mm -hmm. Rather quickly, because he has three albums, you know, from the 79 through about 80, what, 82 or so, and then comes an album called Infidels. Now, it's full of religion, yep. but, but it's also breaking with a, a, a naive. So he, he's, he's always going through that process, you know, and he went all the way in to this evangelicalism, but then he saw beyond it, I think, to a richer, and he continues being deeply biblical, deeply religious, um, but he's always, he's not busy being born, he's busy dying. He's always in a self-critical sort of mode, too. Yeah, I agree um, with that. And I think that a lot of people say, oh, I, a lot of my, my friends who are not Christians say, oh, I hate, the, I hate the evangelical albums. And then he snaps back, and I'm like, they're all evangelical albums well, from right. then on, if you listen with Christian ears. But he becomes less um, ideological, and ideological about ideological, it and abstract, right. and in some ways and goes more to the heart of but it. But they're darn good songs, oh, yeah. too. They're brilliant I, songs. They're darn good songs. <laughs> I mean, the, the rants from the stage are one they're, thing, but the yeah. songs from those oh, records yeah. are like pressing them. on, and yeah. they're, they're marvelous. And of course, Every Grain of Sand, one of my favorite songs, mm -hmm. is I think the best of his Christian uh, music, because it has all that lyricism, and it has the sense of... of, of you know, tambourine man and, and uh, tangle up in blue and these great, you know, but then it's articulating this Blakeian vision of religion. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I always love about when you guys talk about uh, Bob Dylan and many of these other kind of cultural figures that, that are creating music and talking about meaning making, story making, um, you know, a big focus that we have at Word on Fire is help to form people to be evangelists themselves. And so to look at someone like Bob Dylan of, here's some, someone who did it, who, who told the story. And mm -hmm. I'm going to quote our own producer, uh, Joseph Glore, that always talks about, you've got to tell the story very, very well. The person who tells the best story is going to win, mm -hmm. right? Um, and granted, we have the story that's true, right? <laughs> um, so those that are watching, anybody who, who might be a musician or an artist or mm -hmm. people who can help create these stories for people, uh, look at someone like Bob Dylan and, and kind of learn the craft from these cultural figures. Uh, but I thought the, the last question I'd like to end on, um, and we'll, I'll start with you, Jason, is now what ought people do with this information? I'm always interested in what does this mean, especially in regard to spreading the gospel uh, for evangelists? Hmm. Yeah, I, it provoked in part by what you said, because I think you're really touching on something important. 
I think that bad Christian art it sees art as just an instrument. It sees it as George Orwell said, all art is propaganda, and mm. it's sort of an instrumental view. Whereas the really great artists, the art itself is, if you like, an event, an event or encounter with meaning. If you reach, I, my, my wager is that if you reach the heart of poetics, you will touch on the mystery of God, and you need not even say his name per se. Mm. Um, that's something you see in Dylan's later music. I personally think he's always, ever since I dreamed I saw St. Augustine, I think, and even before then, he's had an Augustinian sort of um, search like yeah. about him. But he doesn't need to always say it because if he puts you in contact with um, his pain or uh, his frustration or his search, you are already in proximate to it. So something I would say about respecting stories is that stories in, of, in and of themselves told well exceed the intentions or even the sight, the vision of the artist, which Dylan has always been respectful of his own art in that way too, is that he's not gonna comment on it because he's not. there's nothing to say further for him. He said the sayable about it. And I think that a real trap for um, Christian art, if you like, is to have to even append, mm. in a some sense, Christian art. Art is art is art, and yes, it comes out of different traditions, but art really well done, like philosophy really well done, we'll start to bring you closer to reality, in my opinion. Yeah. No, that's good. Paul Tillich had a famous line where he said, Cezanne still life is more religious than a kitschy crucifix. <laughs> and what he meant was, you know, a great work of art, like a Cezanne still life, gets you in touch with reality. And Cezanne does that, I think, as well as anyone in the modern uh, period. But it speaks to a very deep philosophical point, which is the world is other than God, right? There's a there's a secular space, if you want to put it that way. Jonathan Sachs, uh, and it's like Taylor here, Jonathan Sachs said, the great or text of secularism is Genesis chapter 1. Because the minute you say the, the stars and the moon and the planet and the earth and the animals are not God, they're creatures of God, they're not God, then it opens up a space of a certain independence and a certain integrity apart from God. On the other hand, all those things are marked by God, sustained by God. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It's a sacramental view. It's neither secularism in the sort of deistic or atheistic sense of a purely non, you know, it's not touched by God. Uh, it's not a, not a pantheism. It's got its own integrity, but it's charged with the grandeur of God, which means the deeper you go into it, whether you're a scientist, you're a poet, you're an artist, you're going to find God. It's, it's going to, you know, it's going to, what does Hafkin say? Like foil, it's going to yeah. shine forth. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's living in that space, mm -hmm. not, not a bland, flattened out secularism, but not a, not a pantheism or like a fuga mundi, you know, I just leave the world behind. It's entering into the world. That's what great artists do deeply, whether into human psychology like Shakespeare. Uh, or a scientist entering deeply into the structure of reality, you will come to, to God because it's charged with the grandeur of God. That's the space to inhabit, I think. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. And once again, Jason, thank you for, for joining us. And Bishop Barron, always great to be with you. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Anthony Paglarini. I'm Dr. I teach Holy Holy. At the University of I'm Notre Christopher Kayser, Leah Professor of Philosophy Sergeant at Notre Dame, and I'm Stacey Tresankos. Todd Warner. Authors I'm an internal medicine teacher. Teacher. Father Stephen Gadbury, a priest from the Diocese of Notre Well, a very special greeting to all the members of the Word on Fire Institute. Good to be back with you. Imaginative Apologetics is the name of our course overall. In the coming lessons, we'll be looking at what I call the four integral features of the Catholic narrative. Because this whole series is about how we are to evangelize the culture, and it's that Jesus wants us to go out and not be afraid to do just that. Newman enumerates the principles of Christianity principle of dogma we've seen. I teach 
the literature of the mystical tradition at the Angelicum University. And I